Hey guys, welcome to Jerry's Live. As always, I am your host, Amy Gardner Dean. We are on JL109. If you're playing along at home with us, you're going to go to the jerrysartorama.com website. Up at the top, there's that search box you're going to put in JL109, and that's going to bring up the products that we'll be using maybe more towards the end of the show. We're going to be doing a lot of kind of hands-on discussion about composition. We're going to be talking about doing some thumbnails to kind of teach you how to see maybe better, how to better incorporate composition into your artwork. And we're going to talk about why it is drastically important that you know something about this topic and implement it in your artwork. Um, Katie and I look at a lot of art, don't you think, yes. Katie? It's besides do art, we, we also are looking at it constantly. You probably more so with social media than I am, but I'm, I'm constantly looking at art and art topics to, to research the show. And one thing that I've noticed, I think more so even in probably the last 10 years, I would say, for me, I don't know if this is something that you notice, Katie, because you probably deal with more professional artwork, that there is kind of a lack of knowledge about composition and how to use it out there, um, more so I think now than ever before. Now, I don't know if that's because a lot of artists have to have regular day jobs now um, to help kind of make ends meet. I don't know if it's just a lot more people are picking up art as a hobby. Um, if just more people in general are creative, so therefore the market is market, I mean market and just kind of social media, I guess with the event, uh, invention of social media and those of us who are resistant to the end like me to use it and finally are now on board, I see compositional faux pas, I guess, if you will, compositional nightmares sometimes, and just a lack of utter total composition at all in artwork, which is fine because if you don't know better, you don't know better. It's like, it's like speaking Spanish. You might have picked up a few words, but that doesn't make you, you know, a speaker where you can have an actual conversation, even order a meal somewhere. So, um, so this is something that I, that I just think is is more important than than ever before for artists. Um, and, and Katie and I discussing this earlier today, we were both saying um, you can have uh, less less line work skill, you can have less drafting skill, you can not have as good of a handle on color and color theory, but if you can manage composition, which I feel personally is the easiest of those, don't you think, Katie? The practice comes with the other stuff. Mm -hmm. Composition is just in kind of even being creative, even if you're, you don't have the best feel for it, if you hammer out enough trials at it, you're going to kind of by default, eventually train your eye to look yeah. at things that are a little more dynamic, so to speak. Um, where, you know, all, all the best color knowledge, all the best line work and all that, if you have no sense of composition, I've seen some lovely florals lately. That's what I'm gonna to go with. Beautiful floral, you know, the, the painting probably is like a 16 by 20 and then it's kind of parked in the middle, all this white space around it no dynamic background to maybe silhouette it, to maybe add some movement to it, no sh real great shadowing that that gives kind of some dynamic angles in it. And it's just like, uh, this poor person here, they're technically wonderful and this only qualifies as pretty art. This doesn't feel, this doesn't do, you know. So that's why we're doing the show and that's why there probably will be, as Katie has already said, inevitably some finger shaking from me. Yeah. Um, she's, I, I, in fact, I think they may have been placing bets as to how soon it would happen before mm -hmm. I'd start, start doing this. So, so let's talk about why composition is important overall. Um, it's vital to the success of your work because strong composition can do the following things. It can override lesser quality skills like we just talked. Um, it makes the quality kind of build overall. It's like weaving a basket. You might be great at handles, but if you can't incorporate the other stuff in it, you put stuff in and it falls apart, okay? Um, 
I, I found a quote and I thought it was fantastic and there wasn't a person to attribute this to, uh, but I'm gonna say it anyway. So it's anonymous, I'm not sure who it comes from. Good compositions, nothing more than a pleasant arrangement of shapes, colors, and tones at its rock bottom definition, okay? But it's still an arrangement. It's not just this sitting there, that is not an arrangement, or does that an arrangement make? You can take this and not have anything else with it, but you've got to know some basics about composition as far as where to place it to make it dynamic, what colors you might be able to use to add interest to uh, symmetry versus non-symmetry. So those are some things we're gonna talk about. Rules, there are rules in composition, but with a lot of the people that I've, that I've talked to, the research that I've done, it's kind of rules are made to be broken. It's they're theories, okay? They're theories instead of rules per se, I think is it's the really best really way to put it. Uh, because you can use them as a guideline or suggestions or an option rather than set in stone, do or die, you know, jump out of the plane without a parachute because you believe so much in it. Use it as a tool, okay? Instead of a, a, a stencil. Um, so a lot of people have heard of the, the golden ratio. Yes, that's the only thing I can liken it to is a that's stencil good. is it's only what it is. You mash yeah. the shape in and it's there. It doesn't have to be like that. You right. can, can use it as a tool to kind of make your own. Good way to put it. Um, people have talked about the golden ratio. It's the same thing as the golden mean, the golden section or the Greek alphabet letter pi refers to this. Um, it was used for more than 4,000 years in human art and design. They're even saying possibly attributing some of the ancient Egyptian pyramid designs to the golden ratio. It's closely re related to the Fibonacci sequence, which we've had people mention on the show before. That is a mathematical concept that's supposed to play out in math, in nature, in design, in music. And math is what, Amy? Four-letter word. <laughs> not gonna lie so so we're gonna look at it but we're not going to use that as a thing because I, I think I think because it's a natural shape regardless of whether it's a mathematical sequence or not you can find a natural shapes in nature and pretty much use that as a template and stick it on anywhere so to me that's not as relevant because it's not a specific dynamic you're gonna waste so much time freaking m measuring and and you know fiddling and stuff with um, with the golden ratio as you are doing art and so i think it's a less productive means it's, it, this is for people who are working at renaissance quality you know artwork and, and design and, and these grandiose paintings that shouldn't probably be watching this show if you are I, I suggest a social life because you already have that that quality artwork going for you you don't need our our probably blathering so um if you can turn on the overhead i'm going to put these on here just so we can Okay, so when we talk about the golden ratio, uh, this is kind of the sequence that we're, that we're talking about. It's taking, and I'm gonna just use this to kind of draw on here. This and this are gonna be your same thing. But it's taking this rectangle in which you're making a square. There's a, a specific measurement for it, okay, which is over here. We're not so much worried about that. We're just giving you the bare bones information of it. So you've got that specific square and then this little rectangle, this rectangle is broken into. So it would only be, you know, box A, box B. Then you've got B and then you're taking it and breaking that into another square and then another rectangle. And then, so then you've got A and B. Then you're breaking that down into another square and another little rectangle. Then you're breaking that down into another square and another little rectangle and then breaking that down. And so this is going on and on in kind of this pseudo endless spiral, I guess, of design. Now where this element can be placed and stuff, I think it's probably a little more relevant in architecture and things like that. Um, I saw some overlays. You, you can Google it and see where they've you know, put it on like the Acropolis and you know, it gives you kind of how to, the, the means to create this perfectly, you know, balanced, harmonious building. This is a little too much for us. Don't you think, Amanda, today? It's, it's, it's not where we really want to go with this. So, 
So what we're going to talk about instead, uh, you know, know that that's out there. That's something you can research on your own. That is uh, a 1 to 1.61 ratio for that square versus the, the rectangle. Um, the best and easiest compositional guideline for most artists. Oh, thank you. Lots of markers. All right. Yes. Is going to be the rule of thirds. So what is the rule of thirds? We're going to show you in just a minute. Do you mind switching? Oh, there, you got it. <laughs> I've got the reading glasses on so I can like see fuzzy on my screen. Um, and then I, and then I was like, there's a fuzzy outline that looks like me. It is. Um, really this is the best overall compositional guide for most artists it is what it sounds like you're taking your rectangle or your square however you're doing it vertical horizontal and you're going to split that into segments okay so it's going to be a third a third a third a third a third a third both horizontally and vertically as Katie said earlier which I was like oh didn't even think about that the Instagram grid if you use Instagram, you've got that grid on there unless you turn it off that shows you the reason that's on there is that's a tool that they're giving to you to help you with composition to make something look more dynamic on what used to just be only a picture, you know, driven website, an image driven website, website, image driven app, app something, social media, social media. So, so that's that same thing. If you've used that now that's stuck in your mind and, and that's going to be kind of how you're going to view it from then on. Um, the origins in this are in, in classical works and Renaissance works is when they really started employing this. Um, it helps create dynamic, interesting compositions because what you're doing is you're putting those key elements either at the junctions of where those lines cross or running parallel or vertical with those where you've got your elements coming in and out. Okay. It helps you use it as a counterbalance for interest. With that being said, always err on the side of asymmetry. Asymmetry, symmetrical means it's even and even, right? <clears throat> asymmetry. It's, it's the easiest way for me to not having to draw anything to show you. This becomes a much more dynamic thing because it's different, it, because it's changed. It's not balanced anymore, okay? Um, you can create asymmetry without chaos, though. Don't don't have it, you know, be like crazy heavy over here and then a nightmare over here. Pick and choose. You're going to have something that's going to be more kind of the main focal point, and then have your other kind of corresponding supporting things on those other symmetry points. Okay. Everybody views this as landscapes, and people have said to me before, but that's just for landscape painters. It's not for landscape painters. It's for anybody. It's for uh, people that do portraits. It's for, you know, rather than, don't make everything in life look like a school portrait. How were the school portraits? They were always straight on like this, right? Arms at your side or in your lap, just this little thing, and just, just a little, it could be a cardboard cutout if it was, you know, other than the hair shape changing and stuff, right? So, so it works for everything, landscapes, seascapes, portraits, still life, anything that you don't want to make look like a school photo. So from here on out, don't, don't make me, okay, I'm using the wiggle finger. I told you. Don't make me come on Jerry's live and just say, hashtag school photo on artwork. Think about this, use things and be more dynamic. So, okay. So that being said, that sounds like a lot of interesting theory, but we're visual people, right? So putting this into practice where we're actually looking at artwork, where we're applying this is how I think you're going to learn it best. Um, it's how I learned it best. And I think just since a lot of us have looked at the jury's self-portrait contest from this year, they've already picked the winners and everything. So not to get excited, there will be the contest next year, but I went through it today because some people have already seen these and you have these when, when things are composed really brilliantly, you have kind of these visceral, you, you just connect with it. There's something that you like about it. It just, it, it grabs you and you, you want to keep looking at it. It, it, it's the difference between A and B. Everybody has a favorite, you know? Even in twins, there's differences, right? So, so what we're going to do is we're going to take some of these 
and I'm gonna, I've, I printed off two. We're gonna put one down and we're gonna put the other down. I'm actually gonna draw, not an exact grid work, but split it up as close by hand as I can to what I'm talking about. And some of them are very simple compositions. Some of them are much more complex. So I want us to look at that. Now, there were some that I didn't think were as successful that were on there that were still pretty decent, but I picked the ones that I wanted to really show you kind of where there's nuance, where there's just something that's really strong, uh, where they've maybe used color to help with that. So let's bust this out, shall we? All right. So the first is our uh, award winner, and I, I just, I love this work. Love everything about this work. Number one, this was 48 by 60 inches, so it was huge. So, you know, a lot of people were like, I'm, I'm not as, you know, impressed by that. If you know it's gigantic, that's pretty impressive, okay? Stephen Mangum did this, it's called Gravity. So here's the one that I'm going to draw on. It's the one that I've got the name on. So if we're splitting this from the edges in thirds, this is pretty close to a third, right? Close to a third. It's your tic-tac-toe board, right? Whether it's vertical or horizontal, so, that markers, I'm gonna use some of yours. Yeah, the magical AOC one, Katie. Yeah, it's labeled so that I didn't feel it from AOC and then I... That's okay. Somehow this marker has, oh, the places it can go. It's like a Dr. Seuss book. <laughs> okay, so what do we have here that's on these lines? What do we have that's segmented into uh, portions? We've got numbers running all kind of right along that line, right? which I love. I think that that is really dynamic. They're turned slightly, so they're up and down. We've got the highlights. Highlights always attract the eye. Notice how the highlights of the eye, especially right in here, highlights are running right along these lines, okay? And, and we always say, have it be two thirds and a third, whether it's, you know, two thirds more white space or two thirds more kind of the weight of our subject, I love this. This reads to me like a landscape. This has some really nice shapes. It has some, I'm gonna take a different color and write over. Do these work pretty well on this? I've not tried them, so we Okay, see. well, we'll see. So this is uh, just a, it's a inkjet safe highlighter. I'm just gonna see if this will draw on here. I want, we've got a nice arc here. We've got a nice line here that, look, continues all the way through that corner of the eye. So that's a really nice line that makes a nice triangle kind of across the shadows and a point like that, okay? People say, use triangles, you can't go wrong with those. As long as you've followed those rules of, of thirds, that gives you that nice thing. Then this could be also kind of a triangle here. You've got triangles here with the angles of these balls right? This is just, this is very nice. These lines kind of echo a circle, which also echoes the balls. These move your eyes around because you've got these nice, very natural shapes, but they connect back into these. So your eye keeps moving. This is work where you don't get bored looking at it. It might not be your cup of tea subject matter wise, but you just don't get bored looking at. There's so much to see and do and it's gigantic. So hopefully that makes sense. This is a very dynamic, very cool composition. All right? So take something that's very complex like that. Then this is Carrie Simmons' red ribbon. This is tiny. This is only eight by six inches. So it's very little, it's very dainty. It's a very pretty little kind of precious subject matter. So what has she done here that's make, made it different than just your typical school portrait? All right, so we've got third here, third here, third. These are my estimations. It may be more or less. Okay, she's engaged an eye on that sight line and the whole side of that face that's in that really nice shadow. So that makes that very dramatic and she's darkened it accordingly. 
all right? Over here, this is echoing that line of the back of the head and then that drops away. So she's got a nice play between light and dark and light and dark in that composition, all right? Then we've got that, so we've got a little bit more than two thirds, so that's filling up the picture plane really nicely. But then I'm gonna go back to this. We've got these nice natural organic movements. This hair pulls back, but then kind of loops around. She's got hair here that ties to this and that loops. Hair here that comes out from the head ties to that and loops. The nice lines of the neck, all of this keep, even though it's very, very simple, it's a very simple composition with these lights and darks, the drama of that, and then the natural lines that you see, it moves that eye around. You want to know more. It's not just your typical school port, even though it's set up similarly, that turned body, the nice dramatic shadows, it just makes for a very clean, very pretty little composition. Okay, if there's anything on these that you see that you want to add, to jump in. Now this kind of is, is an interesting one because it's boxed in so that it looks very similar. I mean, you can already read where those lines are gonna go. Sean Briscoe did this, it's called Hiding from Life, Agoraphobia and Social Anxiety. This is actually a painting with cardboard over it and torn that looks like it was probably either gessoed or maybe even watercolor paper mounted to the cardboard. So we got our lines here. So that's gonna go right across here, right across. That, even though it's centered and very even, this makes a very strong statement. You've got the eyes right in the middle on that plane, but on those lines, right? here and here, then you've got this cardboard that's been ripped very, very carefully where it's working. It, although this is balanced, the asymmetry of this and this look on the face really gives you the, the feel of how this person is feeling. Very trapped, very kind of hidden. The little lines in the eyes, the shadows makes it all very, although it's very simplistic and very balanced, it's still very masterfully done. Don't you think, Katie? Yeah. All right, this is Robert, I'm guessing it's Herrer, called Finishing Touches. This is actually a pastel work, uh, almost square, 15.5 by 16.75. Um, until I blew this up, I wasn't sure if I wanted to include this. And then once I blew it up, I really liked what was going on with the color. And this is a good example of how color can really play into your composition. So we've got here, here. It's a little high on those, but you get the idea. All right, so this highlight right here along the front of the face, I'm not gonna push on this, but so you can see it where it's not blocked. That is a really nice dramatic balance where it's pulling that attention over to here. So it's making it, even though there's something here that kind of is the same height, his artwork is the same height as him coming across, it does make it asymmetrical because there's the balance and the weight of him. But with that highlight, it's the focus is on him, light bounces down to the palette, bounces back up via this kind of line along the arm and that highlight. So you've got this great triangle going right here with the light and the color and kind of his arm. Um, then you've got the nice triangle here going across with the subject matter. You've got some nice kind of parallel lines going in here that add to kind of directing you back if you should come down visually nice hot color back here, a little bit of hot color pops here and here that kind of help move that eye around. So he's using not just composition, but he's using color in the composition and light and dark 
to his advantage to really keep the viewer moving around and really looking around this this picture. I, I once I blew it up and saw it and could really see kind of the grittiness of his pastel lines and some of the smoothness. It just is a really really nice job. Even even the texture where it's smoother in some places, and then a lot um, kind of more active line work really helps with that composition to pull the eye around. Are these pretty easy to see? Mm -hmm. is, is everybody kind of starting to get the, yeah. the gist? This is, I, I think, well, I've got many favorites, which that's really not what a favorite is, but that's how it works with Amy. This is one of the ones I really, really love. Um, and, and it was very immediate and right away the first time I saw it how much composition plays into this work. Straight lines would be helpful, Amy, straight lines. Okay, can everybody see that? Her face is right on kind of this, in this upper quadrant along with the rest of her body. I wish that this had uh, photocopied a little easier. You cannot see the rat and I could not change it on my monitor because I didn't have a program to lighten it up. But there's this beautiful little rat down here with an apple. Um, and then she's got all these rats around her hat kind of as a halo. And then it almost looks like a tool has been used to kind of almost excise like a little bit of the painting here and here to kind of follow some of these lines. So you've got this beautiful circular shape echoed with this beautiful circular shape of the apple with this natural shape around the rat, with kind of this natural shape here, this natural shape here, the hand, another natural shape. So it's like this kind of echoing of circular edges, the halo, her face, the rats are all these great little circles going around. You can't see none of that pink on this page. Oh, dang it. Well, <laughs> what what would work? You think I can see want... you moving it. Okay, all right. Gone. So let's let's try this. It's going to make it so we can't see this at all. So we've got circle. It's hard to go over that. Circle, circle, circular, natural shapes. All these great organic shapes based off fighting almost kind of with this very linear composition that she's done with light sweeping across, light sweeping up, light rounding out to then kind of come back up. And what we can't see on these printouts, I, I urge you to go to the to the winner's page. Um, you guys were gonna post that right in the mm -hmm. thing. Thank you, ladies. Just the patterning of this is just sublime. It, it's just an absolutely like masterfully crafted composition, I think. I, I, this in, and an, another couple ones are, are big favorites. All right. Here's another example kind of like the little face peeking through the cardboard. Oh, did I say? Yeah, I said that was the Felicia Carbon. That other one was Felicia Carbon, and it was um, an 18 by 24 in oil. This is Haley Smith, and it's called Sol Solace. It's 12 by 16. Are you... Seeing if we can get something oh, that's darker. Oh, that. or oil, oil crayon even would be. That would probably be easier. All right. So this is very simplistic, and it it could be considered kind of your run of the mill school portrait, almost looking thing. But we're going to talk about why this is actually really nicely done. So her face is right in the middle, right? However. This is where you can take something that's very simple and make it very complex by how you do the colors and the shapes and the patterning. So we've got a nice play of light and dark. This is all very dark values, but then the face and the little hand are very light. And then you've got some kind of darker, not quite mid-tones. They're, they're, they give you some kind of waves. The hair gives you some waves. So she's used color to really move your eye around and to help aid kind of a planar composition. Okay, this hand is kind of an organic shape. It twists up. You've got that nice circle kind of echoing with the twists over and over. These waves kind of roll you down. 
Anytime you see something up and then it's got lines that go down, whether it's wavy or straight, that pulls your eye down because just like reading, it's a natural way that we look at things, usually left to right and usually up to down, right? Unless there's an arrow pointing back up, it's generally not, or something that's a very hard line, it's generally not gonna go up. So this brings it down, this little wisp, pulls you back up like a little rope. Now, oh, let's see if this works, okay. So she's got this going on, okay, oh, with the hand, there we go. Then you got these little tendrils of water. To me, it looks like she's underwater almost, don't you think, Katie? Mm -hmm. I think that was what we or were thinking. Floating in it. And then there's hair. So you've got these repetitive shapes of that that pull the eye down, pull it back up with how this hair curls around and around, okay? Very, very simplistic but still very effective and it makes for a very compelling, different kind of a composition. Okay. One of our viewers um, actually thought that you were drawing these shapes onto a transparency ah. over the top of yes. the painting. Yes. Yep. Um, that's what we'll, we're gonna talk about, that that's a good way to pr work on your thumbnails to kind of see if they're being effective as opposed to drawing straight over them. Did they have a question about that or they just thought she, that it was She uh, wanted to see just the geometric shapes that you were putting onto what she thought was the transparency. Oh, okay. Just to be able to see them separate. Okay. So I don't know, maybe if you could do one or two of those and post them to the live group. Uh, we can see, or we might have some transparencies. Okay. So this is Judy, I'm guessing it's Takas Solon, guardian angel of the good death, a self portrait. This is 40 by 36, so this is gigantic. We went to her website because we were really curious what this was about, and, and she talked about that it was about her mother being able to kind of die at home. Um, and it was a very, very moving piece, which then kind of made a lot more sense as to what some of this is going on here. Ah, well, the biggest problem is when I draw on that, then that's going to be it. Or is there more? No, there's more. Oh, yay. There's a whole pad. A whole pad just for me. All right. It won't work with the white, but... No. Okay. So, well, it's... I mean, the oil has to all draw on that. Yeah. Okay. So, we've got that shape here, right? What do we have going on with this? We've got all sorts of things. This is coming right across the eyes almost exactly, and right across the center mouth, right? This is coming across the action of the hands where she's almost kind of gripping at her heart here. It's coming across kind of under where this is propped up. It's coming across where this hand's supporting this hand. This is kind of isolating her as the forward figure. Even though this is one, two, three, and in a balance, we've got the two thirds rule kind of here down, right? So the weight is okay for that. And the way that we've got all these angles going, this is far from kind of a basic, I'll do this since this is so dark with this transparency. So we've got all these lovely little triangles going on here. Coming across, there's a little triangle here, another triangle pointing up, little triangle there. Just all these nice little the eyes looking across, so we've got almost a gaze kind of where it's focused like this. So it's moving, the, you always follow the eyes in a painting, right? Yep. That's, that's why people tend to say the eyes in the painting are following them when that's not what's really going on. It's just, we're drawn to eyes as people. That's how we read other people's emotion. Because somebody can say something or have a facial expression that doesn't always tell exactly what they're meaning, but usually you can, can from around the eyes you can tell. So this is grief. This has got this little triangle here. There's the triangle made kind of by the wings coming down, right? So we've got a lot of lines. Even though this is very organic looking, it's also very linear. We've got a lot of stuff going on here. And the wings, I like how the wings are almost caressing the two heads here, almost like a halo. See that? 
So, and red, what did we talk about red for the, the color theory thing? What is red? Power color, right? Red and black are your, your boldness, are your, are your power, me. your intensity. Even maybe with this, your strength, mm -hmm. right? Because she's coping with how she's letting her mother die because that's her wish. So beautiful composition, beautiful painting. All right. And that's like a little scribbly thing, which that's kind of cool because you can see the, the actual painting picked up. All right, so this is a charcoal that, uh, even if it wasn't a great composition, is stellar just in the, this is huge, 76 by 55 inches. A drawing. In charcoal? In yeah. charcoal. You know, how long that took. This is is one of my favorite pieces because of the composition and the I uh, just just the sheer size and you can see that she even used some washings on it and I just would love to meet this person and shake her hand. Got me very excited. All right, so I'm gonna do this and just put this over it and break it up that way. I think that'll be just as easy as as anything. All right, so I think the white well. This will show up on this. Okay, so we've got one of those lines running right through the composition. Squeak. One of those lines running right up the drape. Line coming across. Line coming across. Okay, can we see how dynamic that is? Number one, we've got this great shadow, you know, great light source here with kind of another milder light source and then this beautiful dark shadow so we've got a nice shadow here created by the triangle all this makes this just beautiful cut out shape very dramatic if you just look at that shape alone how dramatic is that that's beautiful then you've got all these other nice shadows nice angles coming across like this like this all these lines do what the line kind of in her rib cage here, the, the kind of seam of the body, how that draws the eye up. This draws up, these come up and swirl back up. Everything is drawing you back to the face, back to the face. Okay, but what's with the face? It's covered. And everyone wants to know, well, everybody that's seen this is like, why is, why is her hand over her face? because this is making you look over and over and over again. It's a very, very beautiful composition. There's a couple really, with the, the overlay, it's hard to see it, but there's some very nice lights that help draw the eye back down. There's even lines coming up this way. So everything is bringing you, drawing you back to that very, very dynamic use of the rule of thirds. And that's from Shana. It's when I close my eyes, there's stillness. All right. This is a little jewel of a piece, even though it's very simple. And I don't know if we need the overlay for this because it's pretty straightforward. See where we've got this? <laughs> Those are not the straightest lines, Amy. Mm -hmm. All right, so across the eyes. The eyes are your window to the soul, right? Nice, nice use of that rule of thirds there. The other one comes just under here, right under his chin. So that kind of helps keep us looking at the mouth. Then this is coming from that edge that's very dark and then coming just to the side of that eye there. So it's drawing you, even though it's simplistic, it's drawing you back up to his face. So you've got this just very nice kind of dark outline cut out that helps tell that story. Angles point up to the face in a shirt. Okay, some of these lines on his face keep you going kind of across. He's used very nice brushwork to keep your eye from straying off the picture. There's a nice little moment right there. The ear is rougher so it pulls the eye back around. The shirt pulls you back up like that. Very simplistic but very well done composition. There were other ones that were nice and tight like this, weren't there, Katie, that were mm -hmm. just not, not like that at all. 
That was Corey Kilgore, and it's just called Me, and it's a 14 by 14. This is Sarah J. Alford Lyons, Dreams of an Artist. Now, we really liked this one for a number of reasons, and I think a lot of this has to do with just the really classical dark sunlight. This was one of your favorites, wasn't it, Katie? With it's just something, it's that same thing. There's just something about that one that would... Okay, well, we, sure we need the overlay for this because we're going to, it's so dark, we're going to need to use the, the white. for the lines, because it comes like this, comes like this, then it comes here, and right across those eyes again, right? So that's your two thirds, so that's when you're putting that right in the middle of a face or an expression, or especially something that's close up, and you've got the eyes in a portrait, that's giving you a very dynamic place for somebody's eyes to rest. And then with the shirt that she's got, we've got these nice little triangles. And this nice angle that comes up with the shadow, this nice angle that comes up to the face. Even in the shadows here, these angles in the shadow pull that eye right back up to the face. The neck here, then the trees. Remember I said the eye tends to flow down Trees push up, we tend to read trees looking up, right? So the, the patterning on the shirt keeps kind of your eye going back up and back up and back up. And then this is just very dynamic, this really nice dark source, uh, kind of where it, the background just disappears. It just, it's like a nice little private moment with this dream that she's having. And again, it's much more dynamic on your screen. Please take time to look at them because the printouts are just, you know, laser copy printouts. This thing is so fun and then, and I just loved it and I wasn't sure why. And then when I started looking at it compositionally, I was like, this is incredible. Turned into the target lady. This is amazing. I'm so, what eye is this on? Yeah, Michael, is it, is it goatee, the way that it's spelled? Cowboy Voodoo. This thing is 47 by 31 and a quarter inches by three inches. This is a mixed media frame that this guy did. Kudos to him, big props. Because these actually have little bottles and things uh, in them and, and it's all cut out and there's like a real snake skin and stuff. This guy just like goes the, the extra nine yards for his artwork, but when you look at start looking at this, this thing is super dynamic. If I can get this dang plastic off here. Okay. All right, so we've got our rule of thirds. It follows this little thing right here where he's put this little wagon. Whether he did that on purpose or not, I don't know, but that helps mentally split that into thirds. So if we're looking at the artwork with the frame, it would be lower. I'm going to choose to look at the painting actually because the frame is, is just kind of. All right, so we've got what? The product. It's like a snake oil salesman. I can't see what it says on the thing, but it looks like a little snake. We've got what? The money here. So he's using symbolism to help with his composition to pull this around. Look at this. The cane's pointing up. The money is pointing up to the cane, which is pointing up. He's got this up here, this nice angle pointing up. People's view pointing up. Look at these great lines in here that give all this energy and this composition where you start following an angle down. They're looking up. They're looking up. They're looking up. He's got this great kind of cut out here with that the blue you remember we talked about that blue can be like a power color he's used it to he's got the blue suit but like make his eyes really super crazy blue and the background blue he's using the color to really define kind of what's going on the movement and the excitement and the action so this is a really really fun piece that's masterfully done as far as a composition goes Plus that frame. Hello. I know. 
Now this is another very simple one, but this is this is great with the. I think that this one can probably just be done like this. This is uh, um, someone named Adele. It's just called Psy. It's a 16 by 16, so we've got a nice little square here. Squares are harder to control, I think, in a lot of ways than a an actual rectangle. This is very dynamic. She's used color to echo it. There's that nice kind of outline here, right? Which a lot of times an outline like that where then this is broken off over here kind of tends to not be as strong, but she's laid this right on the line with the lip and the mouth and the hand kind of cupping and curving up. She's used color. She's got blue in here. She's got blue in here. There is this echo of these beautiful round shapes, even in the shadows, that there's a shadow there, there's a shadow there, that keep pulling that eye back, back, back to the girl. And then if you pull that up on your screen, it's hard to see on here, the, the texture in how she's painted this is very nice and it, when it's on the screen, you can actually see the texture kind of pointing back down to her. So you'll have kind of some of this stuff going on with that. So that's a very simplistic, but very powerful with that color, with the darkness, um, a very powerful piece still nonetheless. All right, let's do a couple more of these and then uh, we need to get into some. This one's tricky, but it really has some great moments. And I think a lot of people would, although you can see that the two thirds is up here, some people don't, didn't like the, I think that they kind of looked at it, the paper doll look to it where it's just very, um, I like it. I think this coming right here and that kind of being right on that neckline is saying something. She's using that composition to say something about how she, yeah, exactly. Frida made a mm -hmm. about how she feels. Plus there's that really awesome diamond right here. I'm just going to draw over this where all of this is very, is much, you know, higher detail. And then the rest of this is kind of these little designs. Her name's Rachel Cosbab. It's called All in a Moment. This is a 24 by 36 inch oil that she's painted all these little, little lines and checks. All this is very plain, very paper dolly, very repetitive. You can see just that repetitive, almost like stamping, right? What that does in being so, it, it flattens that out besides kind of that pattern that she's done where it makes you view it as a unit, makes it that much more paper doll like. So she's used kind of those compositional cues of repetition with the lines and with the color and the kind of the handbag and the basic arms and stuff to really make this move all the more, which to me, this is, this is almost a stressful thing. How do you take that as Katie? This is a lot of movement with mm -hmm. those, with these little lines go like this, their chevrons across the whole thing, which I think to make the frazzled look on her seem even more frazzled. So she's mm -hmm. using, using that composition to evoke a feeling with all those lines, the, uh, the overwhelming nature of it. So I like that. All right, uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Let's look at these. Last one, and then because we're getting close, yeah, we want to do a little bit of uh, we want to do a little bit of talking about doing some some thumbnails and how you can kind of start employing this stuff for yourself. This comes right up through her and right up that arm and across and across. So see all these nice dynamic things, this light with the wrist that plays out here is on this nice angle to that. The hand is here, so that's a nice action moment of where it's intersecting these lines. The face is right on that line and almost in that corner, so that's kind of intersecting. 
this is following that line. This is a really, really nice composition. And then it's got this nice kind of line of light coming in that's then going to move that around. We've got kind of more of these organic shapes. Triangle, right, with the hands. Triangle, triangle, triangle. If you're going to start getting into, for those of you that are big into, but is it a triangle? There's some triangles. Okay, that's Catherine. It's called Whispers of Light. It's an 11 by 14 oil. All right, so in looking at those, I hope that you can take this and start looking at, even if you just take an image of your art uh, with your cell phone and put the grid over it to kind of see wh what have I done that's successful? Where have I kind of maybe not been as successful in, in using kind of that idea to filter things out. Uh, let's see. Let me just put this here so you'll be able to see it. All right. So if we're going to want to start doing this ourselves, first you're going to have to think of your image shape. Are, are you going to be working on a specific canvas? Because when you do thumbnails, you need to do them size kind of and, and structure specific to, even though a, th a thumbnail's small, right? But if you're using a horizontal canvas, say you're using something that's 12 by 24, that's gonna be a very different thumbnail size than if you're doing a 12 by 12, right? You would be amazed how many people will do a thumbnail and they don't take into account what they're actually going to do it on. So you either need to know ahead of time, I'm going to do it on this specific substrate so that you can get that sizing kind of figured out so it's as close as possible. Or you need to do them first and then buy the substrate. I mean, I hate to say that because we all want to save money, right? But don't say, well, I'll just, I'm going to get some ideas and then I'm going to fudge it and put it on there. That does not ever translate well if it's not the same dimensionally, okay? Um, then something I see people do all the time. Are you framing your work or are you not framing your work? If you're framing your work, mentally, either, either take a pencil physically and draw that line just to the outside of where that frame is going to come and cover your canvas. Paint over it and around the side but don't use any of that space for your composition. Cut in even a little bit more than that, like a quarter inch, because the worst thing you can do is have this beautiful composition that you stick the frame on it, and all of a sudden where you wanted something to show around, maybe an elbow or something, because that's part of maybe you've got some color swooping around there or whatever, and then all of a sudden you've cut that off. What is that going to do if that line was supposed to come down and supposed to suggest moving back up to a face or something like that? you've cut that off and that's going to just continue right off that canvas. So you need to think about, is this going to be framed or not? If it's something cradled where you've got like a three inch cradle on it, probably even if somebody buys it from you, they're probably not going to frame it. But consider that just because you weren't framing it to show doesn't mean that somebody might not buy your piece and then frame it. And then that composition changes. So I urge you to keep that in mind when you're planning a work. Okay, um, and kind of figure that extra space into that thumbnail. Um, for each thumb, each like artwork that you in, think of, like I, there's so many people that will take their canvas. I see them over there. They've got their pencil. They're drawing it or whatever they're drawing it on. They don't have any sketches of what they're doing. They haven't worked out a composition. They, they draw it, it's way bigger than they want it to be, it's way smaller than they want it to be, they're erasing, they're moving things over. These thumbnails are saving you time, they're saving you energy, they're saving you wear and tear on your canvas, they're saving you from um, putting a lot of detail into something that then you're not going to be happy with because a lot of people will fight tooth and nail and just continue and soldier on with what they've got on there because they don't want to give up. Don't you think that happens, Katie? I know so many artists that have that, that happens with, rather than scrape it back or, or 
paint over it, uh, you know, another another tone ground to get rid of it and start back over, they d just tooth and nail will will go to their grave trying to make that thing work, and it's not going to end up being you know a positive like happy experience number one because they're miserable and then number two it didn't it's not panning out so thumbnails do do five thumbnails for your one painting try some different things mm -hmm. take that that clear plastic put it over your thumbnails draw those rule of thirds over it this was perfect it worked out great oh my god why what was i thinking take that time to do that i guarantee you Doing two, little two-minute sketches, uh, I, I think the ones are in here that I did, these are... Even in the studio in photography, we've taken it before where we, like, dry erase on a screen. Yeah. Or put tape on a screen. Yeah. To kind of figure, like, you're yeah. on something. Okay, can you show these, Katie? Mm -hmm. So, and and I what I did with these is wrote notes, because that's what I do when I do thumbnail sketches, okay? So... All of these follow that kind of, let's take one of these and we'll just show this. These are all three to four minute sketches, okay, of just some little solvent bottles. Um, we'll do these two on this and then we'll, okay. So, and I, I promise you I did not draw this out ahead of time. Okay, see how we have some nice lines intersecting here? We've got this little bottle coming along here. We've got it coming over to the edge of that cap. This base is coming over. There's a shadow in here, so that's kind of right in with that bottle. Um, let's see if this will work. Right, we'll do this. Okay, there's like these shadows in here, so it kind of pans into that. There's this shadow under here. This goes up right up the edge of this little cap. So that's very dynamic. This is coming down the side of that bottle. So this would be a, a decent enough thing. Now I would take that further. And when I do these, there's, you can see a light, there's a mid value and there's a dark. I would take this, whatever my darkest thing is, and I would make sure that's gonna be good. If the caps are gonna be the darkest, that's the darkest. Then I would come back in with some sort of, of gray value that is gonna be at like a 50% or darker. Yeah, that doesn't show up on there. Okay, the purple is going to be that value. I put that on there to see. Ah, yay, green. <laughs> How I want those darks to be. Yes, that's very helpful. Thank you. A little bit different than the other. Let me, let me see if I can do this over this for right now. Oh, yeah, okay, there we go. Oh, but I'll use that on the next one. Okay, so that's my darkest. Here's my lightest. There's kind of the stuff in between, and then these bottles of fluid or different colors, they'll be kind of a little bit mid-range, but there wasn't, I don't care what those look like, I don't care what the highlights are for this. This was just to get a very good kind of baseline of, you know, is this is this gonna work well for what I'm doing? Can everybody see that? Is that making sense? Mm -hmm. And I know that someone suggested this become a drinking game, which I think is hilarious, because I know I say that, but, but without you here where I can talk to you, yeah. And that was something that in, in my workshop recently, that was so nice to be able to like, if somebody's not getting it, I say, what part are you not getting? And then we, we work on that, you know? Okay, so here's the next one. This one would work as well. We've got, it comes down that bottle edge. This is kind of that bottle edge. We've got the, our, our lids kind of nice. It's a nice kind of, asymmetrical balance between these two and this. This is obviously kind of larger, so it's our center of interest. Where this one, kind of maybe this grouping is the center of interest, since they're together and they're closer to the same size. Then instead of that coming up there, I wanted this to be a kind of rounded, kind of to get that eye to, let me get another color to, ah, and it moved. This, will work. this to be kind of that organic circular shape okay so there'd be and then there'd be these circular shapes then there'd be this circular shape trying to work in kind of a repetition of 
kind of some sort of with the lights and the darks and things like that okay now this one I did that longer rectangular one it's just square ah, and a blue vein. All right, close to the bottom here. Um, nice hard line right there. This is kind of using some of this empty space for interest. Notice how when we talk about asymmetry, this is stacked over here, right? Symmetrical means it's balanced, the hand to the hand or asymmetry, right? So we've got a nice asymmetry here. This is kind of a little bit more getting into kind of these triangular shapes with this one for something a little bit different. This is coming down at an angle with that shadow. Can everybody see kind of what the differences are with that? So this would be my darkest probably. Then I would block this out. Okay, so we've been doing this, what, for maybe five minutes, right? Mm -hmm. Each of these took three to four minutes. So right there, I've got what could be three pretty decent examples. Any of these might make a really nice painting. What I would need to do from here is I would probably do color studies, right? And see if that changed the, the I would pick one, like if there's one where I'm just like, this is the one I have to have. This is, you know, ideal. This is, if anybody's wondering, the, the numbers are on the bottles. The numbers weren't, uh like uh, draw this bottle first. It was just, I liked the numbers and I thought it was kind of a neat um, little thing. I like print and copy and, and numbers in paintings. So, um, you know, if this was what I was dying to have, if I just loved this, I would take this and draw the same sketch out very quickly, just in sh basic shapes. And then I would take like watercolor and I would try some different, like we've talked about in color and composition, when we talk about these little, hold on, I'm stepping off camera, I'm putting this back over here. The little bottles, right? Just like that, trying to decide which one of those that I liked best for a painting. I would take this painting and I would do m maybe four or five little color studies with it. I might find a couple that I like. I might find three that I'm like, this would be a really awesome series. I'm going to do all these and do a different painting of each. Okay, but, but that's how I would know that's the composition I like. Then I would decide how color could maybe make some things different or, you know, changing values or, or doing something like that. And with the color along that same lines, using a reflection on the bottle, for example. Yes. And where would I want to put those? I would want to put those in some of those places that are in that grid work, right? If I wanted to add some highlights or something that's like maybe a really drastic dark. Okay. So use, use that. It's, it, although it doesn't have to be followed specifically. And in looking at these, the, the reason we looked at those artworks is some of those didn't follow the rule of thirds the most specifically, but because of color, because of kind of some of the organic shapes, because of some of the angled shapes in them, they made them way more like successful. They, they used it as the template, not as the stencil. Okay. It was a suggestion, not, not a rule, a law. One I'll let our, you bend the rules some. Yes. One of our viewers on YouTube was asking if you would be addressing composition in landscape at all. If that the, this wasn't so effort. much, this was using portraits as an example. She asked if, if we were going to do this with landscape. This was using portraits as an example. These same techniques are what you apply to landscape. By okay. Everything. You apply, yes. And, and, the, and they may have missed the beginning where we talked about, can it apply to still life? Yes. Portraiture. Yes. You know, uh, anything, anything. This applies to anything because it's composition based. It's not subject based. Okay. Are there any other questions? I, I know that we're going over and everybody was, and I quote mesmerized. They were just enjoying the lesson. 
it, it's like when we look at color and we looked at, and if you haven't seen our color and composition episode or our color episodes, these play in with these. We're slowly building your skill levels and your thought processes into making you a better artist with these shows. That's, that's the point of why I do this. Otherwise, I could go home <laughs> and not be here on Tuesdays. But I care about you guys. And, and I know that this isn't something, not everybody can go to art school. Not everybody wants to go to art school. Sometimes you learn better on your own. Just different personalities learn different ways. But because you're visual people, I'm hoping that as I give you these little tools and we give you these tips and tricks and kind of new ways of evaluating art, whether it's yours, whether it's somebody else's, new ways of evaluating color, slowly, and you can go back and watch these at any time. They live on our YouTube channel, they live on our Facebook page. You can go back and be like, okay, so now that I've got this, maybe I should rewatch a color episode or maybe I missed one of them. Let me see where they were talking about this and that. That's why we look in, at, at all these different things and, and, and looking at other people's art is the quickest way to learn, I think. Because you see what in, what in, it works in practice rather than just in theory. Okay, especially at museums. Obviously those people were doing something right because they got in there. Yeah. I'm just saying. True. Not that nowadays a lot of us aren't doing the same thing and just not being recognized, but that's just how it works. Well, sometimes too when you're stuck looking at other people's compositions and other people's artwork, like if you just can't quite figure out why yes. painting isn't becoming successful, sometimes you just need those little like, oh yeah, little light bulb moments. Yes. Sometimes other people's stuff helps you do that. And you know what, that's a good point for when you've got uh, artist block, so to speak. You can clean your studio only so many times and you know go through your supplies only so many times look at other people's art get inspired okay or even take this stuff out and go maybe I'm having problems with composition get just some mylar put it over old past works put it over sketches put it over art in books use that as a tool to to see what it is that you might be missing okay sometimes that'll spark it all right so no more questions ladies okay yep. If you have questions, that's fine. Unfortunately, with YouTube, I can't go back and answer those in the feed, but in Facebook, put the questions on there. I co will come back, and it, sometimes it takes a few weeks just because there's a lot going uh, on. It's crazy here sometimes, most of the time, <laughs> all the time. But I, I try to go back and answer everybody's questions. So, um, so definitely, guys, go ahead and do that. Now, I know that last week when we did the colored pencil, I know Will is working on the wood grain. We did the time lapse mm -hmm. to finish the wood grain. Um, where will that be posted when it's all said and done? Uh, definitely on YouTube and then we're gonna put it on Facebook okay. to put in the group as well. Okay, so we'll go on Facebook, it'll go on YouTube, but we'll put it in the group when it's all done. So look for that. And I did put a finished picture of that in there and I will try to get the, what was the other thing that we did? Onion, yeah, I'll get to that, so. Um, yes, I will be away at the dog show, so I can't promise that'll be done this weekend. I'm sure they would take some dog sketches while you were waiting. There, I, if I have time in between breeds <laughs> that I'm showing, I'll, I'll try to do some dog sketches because that's dog fun. Photos. Everyone loves dogs. Yeah, right? that's true. That's true. Art in motion. All right. Um, okay. Well, since there's no other questions next week, we are talking about foreshortening. What is foreshortening? And and we're going to use people in this manner, people and animals for our subjects. Foreshortening is when it's not just drawing my arm like this, it's drawing my arm like this. How do you make that read as my arm extended pointing at you? This is foreshortening. You're taking something that would normally be flat and you're actually having to render it where it's coming at you, where you're losing some of that perspective. You're you're gonna have to focus on shapes. This is where you have to just throw caution to the wind and only look at shapes. Don't think of it as arms and hands and feet and all that stuff. And we'll do some animals too because sometimes that's the kinder, gentler, less scary uh, thing. But you know, if it was furniture, it'd be perspective, right? So foreshortening. That is next week. Um, and I think I, we've got a new image up that's actually a person that's kind of doing yoga or something that's foreshortened. So on our Facebook or website on the website listing where you can go to Jerry's live on oh, Jerry's .com and sign up for the event if you've not done that as a reminder so all right so that's next week that'll be JL 110 until then ooh, I guess we'll we'll see you next week take care <laughs>